Scientists are trying to understand why the eruption of an underwater volcano near Tonga in January was so powerful and catastrophic. The explosion caused a sonic boom heard across multiple countries, sent a plume of ash halfway up to space and triggered a tsunami that swept across the Pacific. So this is a picture of the island taken in January, showing the two islands connected by a crater before this massive explosion. The seamount produced one of the fiercest volcanic explosions in more than a century. People were astounded by these images of the smoke plume as a result of the eruption. And now let's take a look at what's left after. So only the higher ground above the water remains now. And the aim is to find out why it was such a fierce blast, but also create better warning systems for the next one. Professor Shane Cronin is a New Zealand volcanologist who's been swimming over that underwater volcano. And he joins us now from Nukalofa in Tonga. Shane Cronin, welcome. So what was it like to be in this spot snorkeling over the top of this volcano so soon after that mega explosion? Yeah, so I've been working most, mostly on the inhabited islands of Tonga, looking at the impacts of the eruption, the ash and the tsunami. Um, and we had a very good patch of weather, so we thought we'd do a bit of scouting before the research vessels came. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a spectacular day. And so we decided to have a little swim and just check out the edge of the caldera. Um, so it was spectacular to see this amazing abyss as it dropped away. Yeah. And so just for regular people watching this, I guess the first question is you'd want to be sure that this is not going to go blow again. How, how are you 100% sure that that wasn't going to happen while you were out there? Yeah, so there hasn't been um, any signs of activity since the big eruption. And uh, prior to having uh, that little swim, we, um, we took the boat out and we went around the islands um, to, uh, uh, twice to, to check out whether there was any bubbling or disturbed water or anything like that um, uh, before we sort of went to that uh, location where I knew kind of where some deposits were that I was targeting to sample and uh, also we were expecting to see the crater there. Yeah. And so, yeah, we're just seeing those shots of you snorkeling towards it now. What did you see? Yeah, so to start with, it was kind of beautiful, um, clear water, unbelievable visibility. Uh, and so it was rocky and covered in ash. There was uh, little barnacles growing on some of the rocks and uh, saw a few angel fish, a few other smaller fish. Um, and the guy I was snorkeling with, D Sugar, he saw a uh, barracuda, I didn't see that. Um, but uh, then we went across that rocky bit and then straight down to this really super deep purple water. We couldn't see the bottom. And the boat sonar couldn't measure the bottom. It was about more than 300 meters deep. So that's the crater? Yeah, that's the edge of this big caldera. So um, think of it as a really giant crater uh, about five kilometres across. Yeah. And so the, uh, there used to be an island there and it, like even where the crater was there from the images that we've seen, there was um, soil or rock. Um, so is, I just, I'm trying to understand you there. Is it the case now that it's 300 metres down to what's left of that in the crater. Yeah, at least. So wow. we were, we, even where the boat was parked used to be an island, it used to be about 100 metres out of the sea level. And so we were parked on what used to be an island and then we dived in and swam across. All that area was a big island, 100 metres high. And now it's at least 300 metres deep and uh, probably quite a bit deeper than that. Wow. W were you surprised it was it was that deep when you came across those readings? Because, and was is that the first time that someone's actually been over it to measure what's, what's happened to the depth of it? Yeah, it is. Um, so there are a couple of research vessels that are coming over to do it properly um, from New Zealand and also from Korea. Uh, there's a Korean vessel out there at the moment. They're being a little bit hampered by weather. But this was the first view that we had a chance to actually go there and see the situation firsthand. And apart from coming across, so re realizing how deep that water was there now where that crater used to be or where the island used to be, uh, what, what, as a professional, as a scientist, what, what did you notice about uh, what was left of the rocks there and what you saw under the water? Yeah, it's amazing because the, the sides of these islands have collapsed inwards and they've kind of been washed by the seawater by the blast. 
So I took a million photographs of all of the edges of it and we were able to line it up from, I've been there before, I camped on that island at the end of um, 2015 uh, with a group of students and, uh, and we, um, we sampled a lot of that um, material already and have written up that uh, material and just seeing now the new uh, deeper parts of the volcano exposed was really spectacular. Um, and also we we're able to collect a few samples of the most recent uh, eruption quite close to the source to match up with the things that we're collecting uh, over in Tongatapu. And what do you hope to learn from this? Well, what we hope to learn is what, what drove the extreme explosivity of this eruption? Why was it so big? Why weren't our models able to forecast the ash fall? Um, and why weren't our models able to forecast the inundation of the tsunami? And so very large tsunamis were generated by this uh, eruption that were locally very destructive, but also regionally destructive and regionally impactful. And um, our current models did not forecast that hazard uh, so that we really need to try and improve those models by collecting this on the ground, you know, actual data. And have you got any theories as to why the uh, models did not predict this? Part of it is due to the submarine nature of the volcano. So it's got that shallow sweet spot, if you like, where the water's not too much weight on the top to, to decompress, uh, to uh, pressurize the magma. So the water and the magma mix uh, to create this explosive interaction. The other reason perhaps was a uh, collapse from the side of the volcano, a big landslide that may have also decreased the pressure. And that's the reason why we need to go back to ground zero to, to really see what has the, sh how has the shape of the volcano changed from when we measured it last in the end of 2015.